Let's take a look back today at one iconic Dakar competitor with a unique concept, the Peugeot 2008 Dakar. To understand the background of this project, we have to go back to early 2012, when the Peugeot management suddenly decided to pull out of Le Mans, although the car for 2012 and even a new hybrid version had already been completed and tested. The reason was the critical financial situation of the car manufacturer at this time. They needed to save as much money as possible and improve their road car sales. That left the capable motorsport department of Peugeot without work and they needed to find a new project on a low budget to keep their department together before people leave to other race teams. So they decided to go to Pikes Peak in 2013, a hill climb race with very open rules. A nice playground for their LMP1 engineers. And although Peugeot doesn't even sell cars in America, so the marketing effect was limited, they built the amazing 208 T16 and crushed the current record by more than one and a half minute. In 2014 they decided to join the Dakar Rally. Up to this point, top cars in Dakar had all-wheel drive. The rules for them were relatively strict, so the cars that were in this category had a close competition and it would have been hard for a new joiner to be competitive from the very beginning. But there was also another, much more open set of rules for two-wheel drive vehicles, originally aiming at small private teams who built their own buggies. Peugeot saw their chance here because two-wheel drive vehicles could have the larger 37-inch wheels, 460mm wheel travel instead of only 250 and, very important, the minimum weight was with 1300kg, a lot lower than the 1900 for four-wheel drive vehicles. So Peugeot's experienced motorsport department sat down and designed a two-wheel drive Dakar competitor from scratch. Since they did Le Mans and Pikes Peak before, it was no surprise to see elements like a pushrod rear suspension or a fully stressed gearbox housing with suspension mounting points on their car, something which was very unusual at the Dakar. The car was fairly small. It was only 4 meter long and 2 meter wide. They designed a very compact and strong tube frame with two massive brackets at the back for the large rockers of the pushrod suspension. Both were connected with each other through a torsion bar. This anti-roll bar is a good idea in circuit racing, but in off-road you want maximum freedom for each wheel for maximum grip, without interference from the other side of the car. So also this feature shows you where the team was coming from. They positioned the 3 liter V6 turbo diesel engine longitudinally behind the cockpit. To use the space as efficiently as possible, they designed the 400 liter fuel bladder around the engine in the middle of the car. The engine itself was connected to the tube frame and the tube frame ended behind the engine. The gearbox, as a stressed member, was mounted to the engine. The forward mounting points of the double wishbone suspension were connected to the tube frame, the rear ones to the gearbox. So it was a pretty LMP1 style design, but very unusual for Dakar. The two turbochargers were sitting behind the engine. Fresh air for them came from the center of the massive roof scoop and went through a large cylindrical filter. This filter was well packaged, but hard to reach for cleaning. The two turbochargers were sending the charged air upwards with two tubes at the side that entered the intercooler from above. The air streamed through the intercooler downwards and was collected by one tube that went down to the engine, split in two again and entered both plenums. Peugeot packaged one large spare wheel in front under the hood, which also created that bulgy nose, and one at the very back. That way the sides of the car were available for air intakes. But an intake at the front was not an option anymore, except for a small oil cooler at the bottom. This arrangement also required the front suspension to be relatively low, which gives coilovers not the perfect angle and required stiffer, hence heavier springs. So it was clear that the main water cooling for the engine had to be at the back. That's also a good idea to keep the amount of water in the circuit low, which saves weight. Unlike the competitors, Peugeot didn't package a standard radiator in the middle, which also fed from the roof scoop, they decided to locate the water radiators at the side above the rear wheels. And these were mounted to a subframe that was connected to the mainframe. The air ducting had, just like an LMP1, openings to clean the radiators quickly at a pit stop. But there was even more cooling at the sides. 
of all the lower intakes were in the front rear wake area. They had damper cooling and, based on their experience from circuit racing, also rear brake cooling. Again, something very unusual for their car. In the end, the rear of the car was full with radiators, pipes and fans. The air outlet for all of that was the rear window and openings at the roof. Fans are important at Dakar to force air through the radiators, especially at dunes where you need a lot of power but speeds are low. But for higher speeds they reduce the performance of the radiator. So if you have a lot of fans it's possible you need larger radiators to achieve the same cooling when you go faster. To improve that effect manufacturers mount the fans with some distance to the radiator but you don't always have the space to do that. The team concentrated on building a reliable car and didn't think too much about weight saving. And so they couldn't reach the minimum weight of 1300 kg and instead were 300 kg overweight. But that wasn't too bad because they were still 300 kg lighter than their main competitors, which were all four-wheel drive cars and were not allowed to build lighter cars. One of the main problems of the car was the combination of small track width and lots of wheel travel. That meant high angle changes for the drive shafts, which quickly wore them out and they had lots of drive shaft issues. After the first year in Dakar, where they only reached 11th and 34th place, Peugeot saw that the concept was promising, but there was a lot of potential for improvement. And so they used the experiences of the first year and did a major redesign of the car for the 2016 Dakar rally. First of all, they made the car 300 mm wider. 300 mm longer and more than 100 mm lower. Why wider? Drivers complained that with the first version they sometimes just drove on two wheels in a corner. More width gave them a more stable basis and because of the increased wishbone length they reduced the angle change for the drive shafts, which helped reliability. They then packaged the two spare wheels either side, now with magnesium rims which actually reduced the center of gravity compared with the high position of the front spare wheel before. Because of the new available space in front, they could also redesign the center of the front suspension. The constraint to package everything underneath the spare wheel was gone. Because they still didn't need a radiator in front, they used the available space for a massive air tunnel, which set exactly where the stagnation point would have been. So they significantly reduced the pressure at the front and guided a lot of air upwards towards the windscreen. This reduced drag and created downforce. Peugeot realized they don't need damper cooling and brake cooling at the back. And so the spare wheels are sitting in the previous position of the air intakes. The main water intakes on the other hand got a lot bigger. The radiators behind them got longer and sat in a flatter angle now with larger fans. Interesting here was that these large radiators now extended lower than the tube frame and water pipes were pretty close to the rear wheels and dampers. So they must have been very confident about their wheel movements, because otherwise there would always be a risk of damaging the cooling circuit with the wheels. Another reason why top Dakar cars today have the cooling always in the center. Today cars can even roll without damaging the vital systems. This wasn't possible with the Peugeot. Once it rolled, it was over. They also changed the engine air intake. The filter was in a good and reachable position now, also because the large spare wheel wasn't in the way anymore. They first had a large intake manifold to the center and changed it to an offset intake in later versions, standard today for Dakar competitors. They also simplified the intercooler where the air now flows horizontally instead of vertically. There's only one intake and one outlet. The drivetrain concept stayed the same, but the engine had around 10 more horsepower. One of the main updates at the back was that they heavily simplified their overly complicated rear suspension. They got rid of the pushrod design, the anti-rollbar, and updated to a much simpler design with the coilovers directly connecting wishbone and tube frame. That way, they also had more space and a better package upstairs for the radiators. They now had less parts that could fail and suspension members were easy to reach and swept for the crew. In 2016 they finally won the Dakar and kept their successful but still unusual design for the following years. They continued to win the rally in 2017 and 18 before Peugeot pulled out of Dakar.
The innovative Peugeot Motorsport department once again found an unusual way to win one of the biggest motorsport events in the world. Their innovative buggy design made the Dakar a lot more attractive to fans and all competitors followed their buggy idea in the following years. This buggy trend then led to the new T1 Plus regulations in 2022, when Audi joined the sport and combined advantages of buggies and four-wheel drive cars. And now it looks like T1 Plus can attract more manufacturers to join the Dakar. I hope you liked this little insight in the recent Dakar history and see you at the next video.